Tonight, we are pleased to introduce and welcome Susan Giles, whose mesmerizing work you may have seen recently here on campus at the Glass Curtain Gallery. Her work has also been shown at the Chicago Cultural Center, Hyde Park Art Center, the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, and the Renaissance Society, as well as mixed screens in New York, Galleria Valle Orti in Valencia, Spain, and Five Years London. In 2021, she was a finalist for a Creative Capital Award. She has received numerous grants, including individual artist projects grants from DCASE, the Illinois Arts Council, a Louis Comfort Tiffany Award, and a Fulbright grant to Indonesia. Giles was a 2023 teaching fellow at the University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia, and is associate professor in the Department of Contemporary Practices at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. So let's give Susan Giles a big warm welcome. So I, I'm gonna talk about some projects and some work, and I want you to feel free to interrupt if you feel like, no, I wanna hear more about how that was made or like how that idea came about and all of that, right? So um, don't feel like you have to wait until the end. Um, I want to say thank you, uh, Joan, uh, Gina, um, organizers here. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I hope you had a chance to see my show in Glass Curtain, um, but I've had like kind of a almost a year uh, relationship with Columbia now in which um, I had a kind of a visiting artist uh, position in which I was able to get into your uh, digital fabrication studios. There's some great staff over there and develop relationships with them, as well as met some students who even participated in my project, Glass Curtain. And so I'm super excited to be back here and meet some of you. And I understand I have some studio visits with some of you tomorrow, so I'm excited for that. Broadly speaking, my studio practice, like if I had to say what kind of artist I am, the first thing I'm gonna say is sculpture, but I also do drawing, I do video, and I really don't feel like I'm, I'm like limiting myself. It, it's really based on what is the idea and therefore what, what would be the best means to convey what I wanna do with that idea. So I really love sculpture because it's physical, it's tangible, and it relates to the body. It asks us to think about bodies in space. And I think that's an underlying thing that I'm always thinking about with my work. I am also, my work also draws on public participation for the work. So to create most of the work that I've been doing in the last few years, I'm in conversation with either communities or individuals or groups of people and listening to them and their stories and recording things that they have to say. And that's a really important foundation for the work as well. Um, it, it can't really exist without that. The title of my talk here is um, Space Has Become This Material Thing. This comes from a recent graduate of SAIC who was a student of mine. His name is Anaruch Singh Shaktawat. And in, in doing a recording for the work that I did for the exhibition here, he said those words, space has become this material thing. And I was just so in love with these words, right? He's actually talking around like COVID and perceptions around how we had to really kind of think of space as six feet or six feet. And, and what did that look like? Or were there particles of sick floating in the air? But I, I loved that for a title. So I can't take credit for that. That's on a roots. So I, I want to think about like how words and speech and gesture, and while I'll be mostly talking about these spontaneous hand gestures that I'm doing right now, I'm so in excited to have the sign interpreter here because I've never had that before. And there's such a great relationship between spontaneous gestures and sign and they're also totally different, right? These are just sort of flowing out of my head without you know, my pre-thinking what they're gonna be, but they're still important and they're helping you, they're helping me think and they're helping you receive information, whether you're kind of aware of that or not. 
So when I'm talking about gesture, in general, that's what I'm talking about. And so the, these gestures kind of, in my work, become a point of connection to space and place. So I've also like sprinkled in some of my Columbia connections here. I don't know if Anthony LeBlanc still teaches here. Um, Anthony was director of the Second City and part-time faculty here. Anthony's such a rock star and was kind enough to visit my class at SAIC a few times to do improv games with my students. But here you see, I, I wanted an example of a point. So a point being a gesture that is, so here we have like the finger is probably one of the smallest body parts, right? Like, you know, compared to my head, my arm, my body, it's very small. But this is a very powerful gesture, right? And it's fact, it's one of the very first gestures that humans do. Babies will point at things before they have speech. It's an example of affect preceding cognitive thought. And so it's, it's that, that kind of links to this idea that we, are, we have to have space to, to think and have language. Language is intrinsically connected to space. For me, this was like this kind of light bulb moment of like where language connects with sculpture, as I said, like me kind of thinking about myself as a sculptor. So here, Anthony's point is, is telling a group of students over there what they need to do, but it's an iconic gesture. So it's one that we all can kind of read and know immediately, whereas we more on an intuitive level understand these spontaneous gestures. So a point could be a point on a hand, it could be a data point, it could be a point as a form or point as a sculptural action, and I'm interested in all of these kinds of points and gestures. And one thing I think that's interesting to know is that even people who are born blind still make gestures with communication. And so, I mean, I think one of the things that does is tells us how, how we are tied to space, like our thinking is tied to space. We're spatial thinkers, right? And so when we make a gesture, these kind of shapes and movements that our hands make bring into physical form something to share with the viewer, something in that space. So whereas the previous image showed you Anthony LeBlanc's iconic or pointing gestures, the work that I presented at Glass Curtain was all based on spontaneous improvised gestures that people made when talking about different things. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that exhibition now, and then I'm going to come back to it with more pictures later. So here is... And I, this, this is actually a video that might play. It doesn't have sound. That's Jayra, and he is kind of reenacting those gestures. So back, like, sort of shortly after the pandemic, I recorded Jayra. I used motion capture to capture his gestures and audio recording to capture his speech in video, and then I'll talk a little bit more about how this process works as we go through. But that's the output of the gesture. Those are all the gestures of the conversation. So he's now seeing these gestures for the first time and then kind of reenacting them. The, the sculpture actually, uh, he's standing in front of it, so you can't maybe tell the scale, but it's actually, it, it's, it's pretty much life-size. So the gestures that he just made in kind of reinterpreting those gestures were smaller, but he's really tall and he's got this really long wingspan, so his gestures were actually really quite huge. So this, so... One of the things that I do, so in terms of like developing my ideas for my artwork, is that I do research and I follow the research from the field of gesture studies. So yes, gesture studies is a field. Um, it, is, it combines linguistics, 
psychology. It's really deeply psychological. Um, sign language folks. Um, and they all kind of come together and study what's happening in speech. And so I go to conferences. I, I read stuff that these researchers are doing. And I've even like had my child go participate in one of their studies. And what that does is like, so for me as an artist, right, I'm not a social scientist. I'm not a data scientist. I'm not a psychologist. But I immerse myself in this topic that I've gotten really interested in. And I read about it, I talk to people, and then I just let that kind of be a sort of a soup that I'm sitting in. And then I like go make the work. So I'm not trying to illustrate the science. I'm not trying to illustrate the studies. I'm just immersing myself in that. And then going over to the studio and being like, okay, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna talk to people, I've got this question. I'm going to do some recordings, and then like somehow this research then kind of filters into the work. So it's not a direct one-to-one. -one. It's about like swimming in that soup, and then that kind of ends up emerging into the artwork without my actually like always intentionally being there. So um, yeah, I think that's something I've been talking to my students about. Like when we do research in visual art, it's like. You know, there are different types of research. I do that kind of library research and, and then I just sit sit with it and see what, what happens. Because the work that you see, like that's pretty abstract, right? You might not even know that's a gesture sculpture unless I told you that, right? Or you started doing some reading. So I understand that. That's an abstraction of what I'm thinking about. And maybe some people won't get that and I'm okay with that. So yeah, so these kind of so these kind of shapes and movements that our hands make when we gesture they are abstracting things they're also enacting things they're evoked, evoking things from our embodied experience of the world and with these gestures we kind of foreground significant aspects of our experience or our memory or our or our imaginations and they tend to be things that are relevant to the conversation that we're having together so if we're describing a place, for example, we might, you know, if it's a pointy building, we might do something like this. If I'm talking about I climbed up the, the staircase to do this, then you might go, oh, maybe that was a spiral staircase, right? And maybe it was kind of tall and narrow, right? So this is different than this, right? And I don't have to say that. I might just say I went up the stairs, but this gesture is giving you a lot of information that I don't have to come up with with the words, right? So you're understanding something and I'm communicating something that might not be coming through in the words. To me, that's just, just really interesting stuff. So again, we might be conscious of this or we might not, but you as the listener can gain some, kin some kinesthetic qualities or kind of essential aspects of my body experience that you might not otherwise. So for me, gestures are where language and thought become sculptural and make speech tangible for others. So just to step back a minute, because Joan mentioned like, that I had done a Fulbright. So a long time ago, so between my undergrad and grad degrees, I applied for a Fulbright, which is if you have any interest in like going and spending time in another country, it's, it's a really great supportive program. I was lucky enough to go to Indonesia and while I was there, I was learning to speak Indonesian and there was some sometimes disbelief that this language was coming out of my white body, I think. And also just weird things happening with like, you know, me stumbling. Like for example, to, to say the word baby is in Indonesian is bayi. But, I, but instead I complimented somebody's bobby. That sounds like baby in Eng to English, right? But that means pig. So I told this woman that she has a beautiful pig, right? And so like you become really aware of like how you're communicating, what you're not communicating, how you're screwing up. You have to kind of put yourself out there. But so I came back from that experience and I was like, I really want to make artwork about like what happens interpersonally when we're talking to somebody 
that isn't directly the words that you're saying. And so while I had a BFA in sculpture, I was like, okay, now I need to study video. Because that seemed like the best way. Again, coming from a sculpture background where any you could be working in any material, but actually, you know, you're picking what's best for your idea. In this case, like, if I wanted to talk about what was going on with speech, it maybe seemed like video was the place to go. Um, but it, then when I was thinking about gestures are physical and tangible in the space, that seemed like a really great way to kind of merge my interest in sculpture with these things about language. And so thinking about this, like, I, I started to think, like, okay, what, what if I could freeze gestures and see them as visual forms? And what shapes would they make? What trajectories would they follow? How could they exist um, as forms that give you something ab about time and space? How could I reconnect them to material space or physical space? And if I did that, would that even be insightful? Like, what, would, what might we learn if your gesture just became this physical object in the space? And what would that look like? So I was excited about this kind of imagining this thing. And so I've actually been trying to pursue that idea for quite a few years, right? Like, I've found it to be, for me, pretty fertile territory. So again, like, this, I don't know how I stumbled on it, but there is this gesture lab at the University of Chicago, and it's one of the world's premier places where they study gesture, and that's obviously our neighboring institution, so that was really cool for me. And so I've developed a relationship with the head of the gesture lab there, and the head of the psychology department. Her name is Susan Goldemeadow, and I had a total fangirl moment a couple of weeks ago, she came to my exhibition. I'm like knees knocking. I'm like, that's how nerdy I am, right? That she came to see the show. But it was really, like, it was a total honor, right? It's like, you think about who's your audience as an artist, and like, sometimes it's curators, sometimes it's collectors, sometimes it's just people you really care about, and sometimes it's like somebody who's like inspired your work, right? And that can be a real honor to have that dialogue. You know, you're not going to make any money off of that, probably, but it, that's sometimes the most fulfilling conversations. So we'll go back to, like, one of the first times that I, I really tried to make gesture physical, material, kind of sculptural. I was at, the, at an artist residency at the Burren College of Art in Ireland, and there there's this thing called the Newtown Castle, and... It is a 16th century tower house, so they would like, if there was a t an attack on the village, they would go hide up in the tower house and shoot arrows or whatever they had at the time down at the people. And, and so it's on the campus and it's kind of a historic landmark. It's open to the public, but it's also like just part of the campus right next to the gallery there. You all know about artist residencies? Yeah. These are really great things, right? You want to apply for these things, right? Time and space to make your work. There's like, there's nothing. Because once you get out of school, that is very hard to find. So there I asked visitors um, to describe their movement. So there was a spiral t staircase there. It was really narrow through the space. And I used video to record. It was the simple question, how does your body move through the space? And then I used frame animation in Photoshop video to uh, draw that. And so here you see this really like same question, same exact staircase, really different embodied experiences of that. And like, I don't have enough data here, or information to kind of interpret that. But I will say like the person at the top is definitely thinking of the spiral staircase as really tall using one hand. This person in the middle is doing a two-handed thing. That's a little curious. There aren't two staircases, so I don't know where that comes from. And it's kind of this tight coil. And this one is like this full embodied experience of going up the stairs, right? I mean, again, I'm not trying to draw any conclusions, but it's, it was kind of interesting to me that this person was like kind of nervous about the stairs. Like, so interesting that that maybe encompassed their body before. But I don't, I don't know if that's true. That's just me projecting. 
So then I took these and then I like made these wire sculptures in my studio and then, and then translated them up. So at that point I was thinking like, okay, if gestures convey information about our embodied experience of that staircase, maybe I should make them kind of big so that when you, you see them, your body feels something. So here I was thinking kind of like tent size, like, you know, small structure like a tent or something. And that's how I scaled them. Um, that's a picture of me in the space just to kind of give you a sense of the size. So they kind of turned out like drawings in space. I mean, they are three dimensional, but like they really kind of flatten out in the picture. They're kind of like drawing in space. And this was me like just bending aluminum tube and connecting. This was also like, like a really low budget show. They, they, they were like, well, we want to offer you this show, but we really don't have a lot of money. So I made it out of aluminum because that's really lightweight and I had to get it over there and I made it so I could connect it together when I got there. So that's always like sometimes, unfortunately, your budget, well, you know this, your students, right, often dictates what you're doing, right? And, and you have to make compromises and hopefully you're still happy with the results. So here is kind of thinking, so here it is in the gallery that's right next to the tower that, and, and I was thinking about like, okay, there's this body experience of this ex exterior thing, and then it goes into your mind and your memory and you talk about it. That then gets externalized into this physical thing and presented in the space where it exists. So I was thinking about these kind of flipping or translations that were happening. And this was like kind of a shift in my work to start to think about this relationship between interior and exterior. Okay, so following the Burren show, so I had done that all like analog, right? Uh, figuring that out. I then was introduced to a way to use motion capture have any of you used motion capture? Do you have like a motion capture studio here? Raise your hand if you have. Do you have any in the same department? Oh, okay. All right. All right. I don't have a motion capture studio either. So I'm using a, a like a hacked Connect camera. Anybody remember Connect cameras, right? So these are gaming cameras that track. They they see your body as a skeleton with joint points, right? And, and then I have a processing sketch. Has anybody heard of processing? This is a, a coding library by artists for artists. And what's great about that is like, you don't have to start from scratch with code. You can just get this library of something that does something and start tweaking it and altering it. Now I'd like to say that I did that, but instead I hired an art and tech student to help me figure that out and then teach me how to do that. So the, the code tells the, the connect to track the index finger and the palm. So I started thinking about gestures as like a ribbon, right? What if this ribbon were kind of emitting from your hand, right? So again, it's already tracking the skeleton, but I'm telling it to capture the data points of the index finger and the palm. So have, has anybody used Rhino or any other 3D modeling software? Raise your hand if you have. Okay, so you might know about point clouds. So what that's doing, the, the processing sketch is gathering from the connect, like graph, right, X, Y, Z data points, and I bring that into Rhino. That's called a point cloud. So every you know split second, whatever it's set to, I can't even remember, every frame, it's gathering those points and bring, it'll bring that into the 3D modeling. I then take those points and connect them as a curve or a line. There's one for each hand. I can't really remember why this one's so wonky. <laughs> I think it's just the angle of it. And then I can connect those two lines or curves as they're called in Rhino as surfaces. Those surfaces then could be made three-dimensional and output in a whole variety of formats. So I was like, this is so cool. Whereas previously I painstakingly like 
did frame animation on every video and tried to figure out the angles and translated it into wire and then translated it into these luminum things. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm automated now. This is going to be great and it's going to be more accurate. And I thought, okay, this will be like a direct digital trace of the gesture. Um, and, you know, this desire to visualize movement is, of course, not new. Maybe some of you know um, Etienne Jules Marais or chronophotography, or Moybridge, who photographed like a horse and found out that the horse's feet actually at some point don't touch the ground. So this isn't new, my idea to do this, right? So like scientific illustrations of movement, in this case, there was a frog and they were able to make a graph of every time its leg twitched, which I think they were doing to it. I don't know all the details of that, was making a graph. And now we can see like what that movement looks like, right? We can have a record of that. And by the way, these kinds of scientific illustrations were circulating widely in the early 1900s. The surrealist artists were very influenced by these in terms of like, their, they were really into Freud and dreams and like this unconscious space, which actually has a connection to gesture as well. So yeah, this is, again, I'm not original in this. So having, so I've got this new neck technological process and now I've been invited to an artist engagement residency at the Cultural Center, Chicago Cultural Center. Have you all been there? Yeah, if you haven't, you should go, right? It's a great building. So I had a show, I was going to have a show there and they gave me three months at the, at the, they gave me like this workspace. And what I did was put out like a sign and a call to the public to come and talk to me about things about the building that they were interested in or things that surprised them or describe something about the building. I also had some people, so this used to be the Chicago Public Library. It was the first library. And it was built like the charge of the committee who commissioned it said, you know, it should be worthy of a great public monument, something along those lines. So it's, it's still like kind of a, um, you know, advertises the city as like a tourist monument, a place to come. So it's got all this significance. And, and if you've been in there, you know, like these Louis Tiffany dome, dome in there and all. So, the, but it, I invited a former librarian from when it used to be a librarian Chicago's cultural historian, Tim Samuelson, and an archivist who all worked in the space. So I wanted their perceptions um, on this too. So I translated all the data that resulted from these interviews into one large scale sculpture and nine 3D printed pieces. So these are all the gestures of that. And I wanted, to, so here I was thinking about the monument as kind of like the individual visits the monument and then they have this memory of it, but it's also a collective perception, right? So that's part of other people's memories at the same time and how do the individual and collective kind of interface there. And I was kind of thinking about leaving those traces in that, in that space. So this image shows uh, part of the installation with three of the gestures. So again, these are 3D printed. So now that I've got Rhino, right, you can output that in many ways, including 3D printing. I bought an inexpensive 3D printer that could print like about this big. It does kind of bad quality prints, but you know, they were to scale. <laughs> because I wanted to try to get the gestures as close to life size as possible. Obviously, apart from the big one, like what does that look like if, if this thing were materialized and was right in front of you like it was this object that you had just spoken? So that's why I printed these uh, life size. They, I used black filament. Um, I cleaned them up with a little black paint because if you've ever done 3D printing, it gets boogers and you have to sand those and yeah, it just didn't come especially with my cheap printer. But anyway, they looked nice once they were sanded and, and painted. So these are some of those. Here's one that I thought was a really graceful kind of gesture. This was a tourist or somebody had visited the cultural center for the first time, wanted to describe the grand staircase there. 
He says there's this kind of smooth spiraling shape that makes this kind of really beautiful gesture. The title, so I titled these to be the words that they spoke when they were making the gesture, and then like call in, that's the part of the building you're describing, and then their name, Cindy. So this was Cindy. By the way, so actually, and I, and I just like confirmed this with Susan Gelbert Meadow, like the, my hero who came to see my show, who's the head of the Gesture Lab. Gestures usually precede our thought just a little bit. Like they, 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 they might be simultaneous, but they help like pull out the words. So the, there is that split second gap. So it's maybe not the exact same time as the title. So the big one in the center comes from the gesture of a former librarian who made it while describing a reference desk that used to be in the space. And so she did something like this. What does she say? A large reference corral, literally like a counter, and in the center were librarians. And she this little kind of dip here. That's what the gesture was. It is laser cut honeycomb cardboard. It is, you know, Oh gosh, well over a thousand, it might have been like 1800 pieces of laser cut cardboard. It took, a, it took me an entire summer to laser cut it. And then they gave me a month to install it and like four people to help me glue it together. And it's hanging from the ceiling. It's scaled to the size of the original desk, or more accurately, the size that Carolyn, the librarian, remembered it to be. So she told me, oh, it was around, you know, 23 feet or so. So that's how big I made it. It's as big as her memory. You can maybe tell here, it hangs like, so I made it, so, so like you could walk around behind it as if you're like at the reference desk, and that would be about like this height right here, like you're at the reference desk. So you can walk around it, you can stand within it. Yeah, I was just trying to decide if I would share this little story. How, how are we for time, Joan? We're okay? Okay, so, so I'll just tell you this little story about this piece. So this is hung with airplane cable, which was like really, really strong. Even though like we knew this piece wasn't that, it's not that heavy. It's, it's Elmer's glue and cardboard. But, uh, so they hired professional installers to hang the work. So I just trusted that. I was like, oh, okay, they're professional. They know what they're doing. <laughs> you know where this is going, giggling over there. <laughs> Um, and so the ceilings are so high. So they got in their cherry picker, you know, lift, and they went up there to connect. So it was on tables, it was all propped up on these tables. I built them on the tables, and then they take the cables up, and they put them into the ceiling up there. And I did not check what are the anchors they're putting up in there. I just trusted. They know what they're doing. So they hung the piece, we took the tables, all the support out from underneath, magic, oh my gosh, it's hanging, it's so cool. I'd been like busting my butt all summer on this. I'm like, okay, I have a two day vacation. I actually was going for a long bike ride in Wisconsin, booked an Airbnb, all that, I was out of here. I get a call from the curator as I'm getting in the car to go, on my, go out for my little, How, like how and they start looking around and like the cables have torn out of the ceiling well it turns out that they're tiny they're tiny anchors like so not only did the attachment the entire anchor came out 
they're so apologetic. They're like, okay, we're gonna do whatever we can. But it's like, nobody can make, like I have to make this work. So I had to like cut out all the broken smashed bits. There were some that was salvageable. Relaser cut a bunch of stuff. Um, they gave me some more helpers. That was really great. And this time they brought in an engineer who was just like, well, look, you don't even need an engineer. You need to read the package on the anchors and see how much weight they can hold. <laughs> right, oh my God. Right, so when you buy an anchor to hang something, it will tell you on the package, this can hold 50 pounds or this can hold 100 pounds. And, and, and basically, so this had nine points and we knew it was, well, let's say we knew it was less than 1,000 pounds. So we just had to divide that, you know, by nine points, it's distributed over those nine points, and then whatever that math is, don't ask me, figure it out, right? But they had totally, utterly, completely failed that. The engineer was like, it's not that difficult. Anyway, they got it done. Thank God, it was, I got this done like a week before the opening. I mean, can you imagine like if it was during the opening and like it, go, or like it fell on somebody or something? Because people were into like crawling underneath it and stuff. Anyway, close call, close call. Thank God it was done. But, but, but I guess that's just like, there's these behind the scenes stories that you deal with as artists. Particularly like if you're taking a risk with something you've never done before, this was the biggest piece I'd ever made. Right, and always check that label on your anchors and don't trust that the preparators know what they're doing, <laughs> even when they're professional. You gotta like check everything. So I learned my lesson there. Um, there were both planned and spontaneous performances. So like I just came in one day and found, um, I don't know if you all have heard of Roberto Sifuentes. He's a really great uh, performer, performance artist in Chicago, teaches a performance class at SASC. I came in and like he and the students were all laying around under like gesturing up to the piece. So that was like, I loved this activation and like re-gesturing to the piece and that it was kind of living within the space. Again, like what are your goals for as an artist? Like, you know, it's not just for me selling the work. It's like, when does it circle around and people are now responding? to the work, or like, in this case, like talking back to the work. Here's the 3D printed gesture made by Tim Samuelson. Again, he's the Chicago cultural historian. He might have, he might have retired. Anyway, he's like, he's really old, but he's got all this knowledge. So the Chicago rooms, I'll just go back. If you've ever been in there, like, the windows are enormous they're multiple stories high and the reason is because electricity was really bad when they built the building and in order to see the books like and see in there they needed huge windows so they actually had these stacks that had glass floors which sounds really cool right so that the light could go through them and you could see the books there's actually one library here in Chicago, if like that sounds interesting to you, down at, to you at Blackstone Library in Hyde Park, actually still has those glass floors in the stacks. I went down to check them out because I thought that was really cool. So anyway, here he is describing that there were these narrow corridors and that there's this little light bulb in the ceiling, which obviously wasn't powerful or else they would have not had the glass kind of coming through. So those are Tim's gestures. In this case, I, I just made these like aluminum rods and put them in these little tiny pedestals to have them like kind of as objects. So, you know, I, I was saying like when I develop, when I finally had this technological process of using motion capture and code and data points going through Rhino, Rhino I thought this was gonna be really easy and, and streamlined, it turns out it, it wasn't. There's always all these problems. Sometimes these like extra information turns up in the gestures and I have to go back and figure out what the gesture actually was and f delete those data points. And there's also inaccuracies, I think, that I didn't quite anticipate. So I had to think like, all right, what is that doing? And I started thinking about like, that, that's a tension, right? That's a tension happening in the work. So a gesture has this emotional promise. If we think about gesture in art, 
you may have heard of Pollock. You know, I'm, I'm not that big of a fan of that. I'm just going to put that out there. There are these video films of like the canvas on the floor and the splattering, the paint, and you know, it's the artist genius. And I would say, if you're interested in abstract expressionism, check out Lee Krasner, who's never got the attention that Pollock did, but she deserved it. Or the Japanese artist, the Gutai artist, Kazuo Shiraga, challenging the mud, right? So we think of like, there's this artist's body in contact with the material and it's direct and it's pure and it's authentic. It's got all this like emotional promise. You can see that I'm maybe a little skeptical about that. And so the gesture that has this kind of romance of like this emotional promise but these kind of like translations and the tedious nature of it disrupts that and kind of creates this tension. And I started to think about like, you know, maybe I like that. You know, they, these gestures now are like objects of study. They're like these artifacts. They're like these things that are different. They're different because of how I, you know, if I 3D print it, I cardboard it, I draw it, whatever it is, it's different, right? Um, and um, it's just not gonna be the same thing. And, and, and also, importantly, whereas like gesture in art, typically like with abstract expressionist painting or uh, the Gutai artist from Japan, this is about the gesture of the artist. Here I'm flipping that. This is the gesture of the viewer. Right, the view of the work. So I started thinking about that kind of flipping as well. That was interesting to me. So I, I met um, an artist named Sally Morphill from Manchester in the UK at a gesture conference in 2016. And we started talking about, so she was doing work with gesture too. It was a little bit different, but we decided to do a collaboration she, we, we, we figured out, uh, we got a residency at High Park Art Center in Chicago and five years in London. They're both very art, artist-centered, not-for-profit organizations that have a pretty long history. High Park is like on 80-some years, which, have you all been to High Park yet? Raise, High Park Art Center, raise your hand if you've been there. This is a gem, this is a gem of a exhibitions in those places. So we engaged with the communities around there to talk about artwork that was had shown there in the past. We started thinking about these, so we came up with the ideas of these as found gestures. How many of you have heard of found objects in art, art and art history? Right? So, so what is a found object in art? What? Somebody help me out. What is a found object in art? It's anything that's like basically an everyday object. But we, we, we take it out of its context and we put it in art and now it's like different, right? So we started thinking about these as found gestures. Like we, we don't know what we're going to get and they become these objects but now we're gonna put them in the art environment, right? Because gestures aren't typically part of an art environment. Well, unless we're talking about like artistic gestures. So we, we, we like this idea of like found gestures. So we called the show, we called both projects found gestures. These works, so this one is a detail of Foley Emmy Wilson. Did anybody know Fo? Fo used to teach here. Fo was in, yeah, so Fo, had a residency there and had the main show in the space at that time. But she did a gesture uh, recording for us talking about a former exhibition of Jefferson Pinder's called the Onyx Odyssey, another performance art artist teaches at SAIC. 
these are also motion capture, but we're only tracking the index finger. So there's not a ribbon with this one. It's just kind of a, a drawing in space. We have a transcription of the words on the wall next to the drawing, and we numbered them. So what you have, and then there's a corresponding number on the drawing. So these are adhesive vinyl and they're stuck on the wall. They were cut in segments and then connected together. And each segment represents like a time and a, and a, and a stretch of words, right? So you can cross reference like number one was happening when these words were saying, number two. So you could kind of get a fuller picture of what the person was saying, what they're perceiving through that way. They're hand painted. We were kind of thinking about reintroducing our hand as artists on top of the vinyl. Also make it look maybe a little bit more dimensional, a little bit more interesting. We were thinking about these as kind of like a musical score. So you've got this like each number is a fixed time interval, but here you have like speech and movement that co-occur. Here we're kind of really thinking, and, and Sally comes from a drawing background, so we're really thinking about these as drawings. Line is prevalent, but they disrupt the common idea of drawing as the immediate trace of the artist. They kind of appropriate these gestures of other people. They've got this kind of encoded movement translated over time. They only briefly, in this case, they only briefly preserve that movement of the body because, you know, vinyl comes off the wall. So at the end of the exhibition, we take them off the wall and they don't exist anymore, right? They're gone. So it's kind of like this slow process, this slow sort of chain. So I don't know if any of you know Rodrigo Lara Jendejas. Uh, is an artist in Chicago, ceramics primarily, and he talked about his own exhibition, which had been at High Park Art Center, not too much prior to the exhibition, and he had work that was on the floor, and so the gesture, so there's this line, so we put, decided to put those gestures on the floor, and one of the cool things about 3D modeling is like you can see these lines from above, right, so this seemed like a great opportunity to make the drawings uh, like physically spatial and put those on the floor, whereas the one up there is like when he was talking about things that were more like uh, body level. This piece has a little bit different. It's four speakers overlaid on top of each other. Hyde Park Arts Center has a free like program for teens. It's a really awesome program where they can do art stuff, have exhibitions and all of that. Um, so we asked some of them if they wanted to get involved in our project, if anybody wanted to volunteer. And as I mentioned, Faux's exhibition was the one that was going on in the main space at the time. So they described Faux's exhibition for us. And you can see that, so each team picked a color for their um, line. You can see how different it is, right? Like. Um, they're all describing the same exhibition, but some people are gesturing very large, some are very small. Um, again, I, I'm not a data scientist. I, I don't know enough about like why that might be, but it did seem kind of interesting to see them on top of each other. Again, there was this text and numbering system, so you could cross-reference them. And then during the resident, so, so during this time um, and and getting to know some of the teens there, I met a young woman named Madison Grant, and she became involved in my next project. And we record a conversation that included her gesture, and it ended up like this, this monumental piece. So I was invited to do, so it turns out, so one thing also that happens like, are, say like invitations and opportunities don't happen out of the blue. Like you're not an artist working in the studio and somebody comes and discovers you. Like you have to be out there hustling and like meeting people. And this, and, and sometimes you get lucky. In this case, 
the people who invited me to do the show had seen the show at the Cultural Center, and they really liked it. And, it, and the stars aligned, and I got invited to do this commission. This is a permanent hanging sculpture, not the people who hung the previous sculpture, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> they were fired. <laughs> and it is a permanent piece, cardboard. So I was super excited that they were willing to do a permanent piece out of cardboard. Um, and I did a little research for them because so like, have you ever seen Frank Gehry's cardboard chairs? So there's some in the Art Institute collection. Um, you know Frank Gehry, the architect who did our like band shell, which is not his best work in my opinion, but um, had did in the 50s or 60s really cool cardboard chairs. They're like cardboard and, and like they're amazing. So I went and I, I got a hold of some of the folks at the museum there, and they told me that cardboard can last for decades as long as it doesn't get wet and the conditions are right, like it's not too humid. So I told that to the people at the University of Chicago, and they were like, okay, cool, great. And, and we have this LEED certified green building, so they thought that was kind of cool that it was this more green material for the work. So that's ideal when you get a commission and they let you do what you want to do. So they did ask, so I don't know if you know this, but Barack and Michelle Obama have taught at Harris School of Public Policy, both of them, uh, in the past. So they were like, well, it would be really awesome if you did something that connected to the Obamas in some way. And, and you know, uh, like, I'm sure you know this, University of Chicago is very, very elite and can be very, very disconnected from the neighborhood, the community. And so I kind of like this idea of bringing Madison in, somebody who was in the high school right down the road, part of High Park Art Center, also in the neighborhood, but much better kind of serving the community, and uh, asked Madison, you know, what she thought, like, and we, we came up with this idea together that, so what she did was respond to Michelle Obama's final speech as first lady. If anybody's seen that speech, it's really a beautiful speech. She's talking about the importance of education. It's like she's kind of passing the baton to the younger generation. Like, you know, this is why your education is important. You gotta do it, you know, um, here's what it can do for you. And so I did a motion capture with Madison in which she was talking about what Michelle Obama's speech meant to her. So in this way, we have, you know, the reference to Michelle, but it's actually a neighborhood teen whose gesture is, is being kind of monumentalized in, in the work. So Madison says, She's talking about, so basically she says like, um, she says, Michelle is talking about not, knowledge as being powerful. And she makes this kind of two-handed arcing gesture, like it's sort of like knowledge, right? So you have, maybe you can't quite tell on that. This is two pieces, it's a two-handed gesture, blown up to be in that lobby space. I'll show you. I thought I would just show you a couple of like process pictures there because like in this case when you enter the Harris School of Policy at the ground level you're on the second floor and it's hanging in this space that looks down on the lower level floor so I had to build it on the lower level floor and then it had to get raised up. So the way this worked is again I'm like over a thousand pieces of, late, of cut cardboard that I'm laser cutting over a month or two or however long it takes. In my studio, I'm gluing them into chunks, like, I don't know, five foot chunks, something like that. And then I bring them to the site and there I'm assembling the chunks. Because unlike the cultural center where we did the whole thing from scratch, I didn't have a month to install this. I had two weeks while the students were on break. And so it got, so I built it on this wooden platform. So I built that first, this like platform, and then it got supported on that first. Inside this piece are very small steel plates. And so this airline cable, which is what you see in the coil, 
go down into the cardboard and they connect to the plates. So the plates are embedded, they're glued into the cardboard. Now because this was a permanent piece and the budget was a lot bigger, the University of Chicago hired a engineer for this and they needed to make sure because there's students who, their tables, students study under this piece they were smart, they didn't want it to fall on anybody. So that's what the engineer came up with, that we were gonna embed these plates in there. So building it on the floor, these are called Sumner lifts. We had four of them, and we crank them by hand, four people at a time, slowly up to the second floor, where they then connected the cables into the ceiling with proper anchors engineer approved, and then we slowly lowered the wood down. It was, I was, you know, it was all like, the engineer was like, yeah, it's great, but you worry as the art, you're like, oh my God, what if this doesn't work? But it did, it's still hanging, it's up there, it's permanent, so if you're ever down there, you can just go in, like even if you're not a student, you can be like, I'm here to see the sculpture, to let you know. It's a gorgeous building, and that's that was exciting. I mean, it's always great when you're making work for a gorgeous building. This is like, you can see it, it's in this central atrium, and you can see it from like any of the floors. This shot over here kind of shows you the space underneath. So normally there are tables under there and students studying. So it's really cool, exciting for me. Here's Madison and her mom. Oh, and so one of the things that's really, really awesome, so Madison is not a high school teenager anymore. Now she's in college, and guess what? She's a communications major. I mean, how awesome is that, right? No wonder her gesture was so beautiful, right? How cool is that? I love that. That's such a great circle. And again, you know, I'm including some of the images of the people who made the gestures. Like I had J-Ra, Madison, I'll show you an elderly woman in a minute. Because for me, this is like this moment of deep satisfaction is when that person sees that gesture that they made, right? Yeah, so that was a really great moment for me. This all went up during the pandemic, so it was all felt really sad and like people weren't seeing it. But when Madison and her mom came, I was like, okay, we're good. Okay, so the drawings that I'll just show, can you even see that? Can you, like, okay, yeah, it doesn't look great, but it's all right. Um, if you saw the exhibition, so this is like a, the new way that I was figuring out how to, like, not do numbering, but actually put in images of the gestures right before the words where they came. So the exhibition at Glass Curtain had two branches to it. It's an intergenerational show. One branch is with a group of elderly citizens. The, the question that forms the premise of that whole exhibition is, how has your experience of home changed during and after the pandemic? And I will just say right here that I wanna acknowledge that to even have a home is a privilege, and I'm aware of that, right? And so everybody who was in this, participated in this, was fortunate enough to have a home and to perceive that differently. So I was thinking particularly about how, you know, grandparents, elderly people were so isolated during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. it, it was a really difficult time. I, I, had I developed a relationship with a group in a retirement home and asked them if they wanted to participate in this project. There were nine of them who did. They were all members of a choir. Um, so this project actually has two parts to it. One is that there were like the transcriptions of the speech and the gesture images. Those I gave to a composer who's the pianist for the choir. She wrote music using their lyrics, and they sang the song. There was an event this summer, 250 people came, um, and they, they, they sang, sang the song. So there was this other aspect that wasn't at Glass Curtain there. Here, a woman named Barb is kind of talking about her childhood home, and then her like home where she raised her kids, and then there at the retirement home. 
For each elderly person, I chose one gesture to hand, render in hand, like either with India ink or, or marker or colored pencil. And here again, I was thinking about like how my hand like slowly, painstakingly, like carefully uh, drawing over somebody's gest drawing somebody's gesture. For me, felt like a, a like an honoring of these elderly people's gestures, like to kind of spend time and meditate on that movement. Here in this this gesture, she says she's reflecting on family re relations, and she says, "You're always going to have some strife," which like you might be able to relate to that. I certainly can. So I thought that was kind of cool. Maybe I was mad at my kids at that moment. I don't know. One woman, sis, had this very sad story. She, I probably, she says, I'm in the apartment. I like the apartment. I'm in here very much. I'm alone. My husband passed away, so I'm alone. That's an experience in itself when you are alone. I've never been alone. It's sad. The place I live has a nice living room. It has an, its own nice bath and a nice living room. It's nice and big, and I have a big TV, which is about all we do is watch TV. I enjoy it very much. It's a nice place and a kitchen. Oh, yes, it has a washer and dryer, stove and refrigerator, and everything you could possibly need. No gestures at all. So whereas for all the other elderly folks, I picked one of their gestures and hand drew it, this one, there was no movement at all. And I was like, oh, wow, what do I do with that? So. The curator, Meg Dugood, and I decided we would just kind of leave a blank space where her drawing would have been and kind of honor that sort of absence there. There was, an, there was another set of drawing. There was another man named Charles who talked about how his wife, I think it was of 50 years, died during the pandemic. And he's making these kind of like circular gestures kind of ticking along these events in his life and when he gets to that part about it was COVID and my wife died his hands really retract and his gestures are tiny so yeah I mean it's sad right like maybe I, I don't again I'm not a psychologist I don't know but maybe there's something there to like loss and absence that our body kind of pulls in or retracts or doesn't move I don't know that seemed like maybe something I would be interested in exploring So as part of the event, I wanted to give something back to the folks who were part of this. So I made this with a graphic designer named Riesling Dong. We made an artist book that had Rizzo prints and laser prints of all the artists' drawings and their speech. It was like you fold it out and everyone got a copy of that. And so it was a way to give back to them. The performance was a really, really joyful event. There is video documentation, but it's still being edited, so I don't have that. And the retirement home had all these restrictions on like what I could and couldn't take pictures of, but I could take a picture of the like <laughs> walkers and wheelchair in front of the drawings while the choir was performing. So I thought that, that seemed like a kind of, I kind of liked that picture. I was allowed to take a picture of one person. This is Sue Young, and she's actually the choir conductor. There she is with her artist book, um, flowers. It was such a beautiful, joyful event. Again, it's like, for me, that's the like uh, real reward of the art. The, the like really true reward of the art making is like this interaction with the people, particularly this kind of when it comes back around to something that maybe I can give back to them in a certain way. So as I mentioned, it was an intergeneral, inter, I wanted this to show to be an intergeneral, hello, <laughs> intergenerational conversation. And so there were the works that were the drawings of all the elderly citizens' gen, uh, gestures. There was also works by younger people, and by younger people I mean like, people who were probably your age, like some who were mostly undergrads or, or about to graduate. And this one in particular was one that was directly about COVID. This is Anna Rude who came up with the, all of the spaces like this material thing. 
here he says all of space is just like particles of COVID or something sick. Makes this gesture kind of like this. And I thought, okay, well, you know, the glass curtain gallery has that, those columns that are right in the, like really not ideal if you want to make a big sculpture. So I was like, okay, this is a, like this is about this thing that took over our lives. It wrapped around our lives. It was big. It was imposing. So that's the one. I'm going to make that big. I'm going to make it wrap around the sculpture. Anarud moved back to India, so I don't have a picture. I don't get. To, I just get to like send him pictures. I didn't get to take a picture of him there. So it wraps around the. creates this kind of, it's called a moray pattern. So if you kind of move back and forth, that translucency appears. I didn't 100% plan that. It's one of those things where you go, oh, yes, I embrace that. That's like, that felt to me like it conveys the ephemerality of the gestures that, and also it engages the viewer's body movement when you see it too. It's, it's really hard to photograph. So this, yes, yeah, so this again, like, these, where these differ from all the other gesture things that I was showing you is that these are all the gestures of the conversation. So it's as if Anarud was standing here, he said this, made this gesture, said this, made that gesture. The cardboard was emitting in a ribbon from his hand, and now he steps away, and there they are. It's this cardboard thing. So that's kind of what you're looking at. I don't know if any of you know Adele Hink, who... Yeah, you know, Adele, yay, Adele. So Adele, I definitely had to get somebody from Columbia for the show, so Adele volunteered, came to the show. And like, I just felt like um, Adele was talking about like when the pandemic hit, how they had to go home and sleep on the parents' couch. And I just, so this is the one for the window space. So through the pandemic, I was in the basement a lot. I just slept on the couch. This felt to me like, yes, that was that time. <laughs> how awful as that was. So yeah, Adele was in the window, kind of inviting you into the show. So just to kind of circle back to the idea of the point, gestures that go along with speech are not intended to be drawings or sculptures, but in this work they become so. A point on the hand is recorded in a point in space, becomes a line, becomes a surface, becomes a form that makes visible the relationship between body, speech, and space. And then I was starting to think about like how maybe drawing and sculpture could be understood broadly in terms of movement and time and dimension, including everyday gesture. But that also like for me makes a leap to also maybe sculpture and drawing are just part of our everyday being too, right? They're in our space all the time. And like, if you might walk away from this talk or ever seen my work and pay attention to somebody's gesture and think about that materially or spatially in, in that space, then it's also a drawing or a sculpture that's been left in that space for that moment, for your memory. So I just started thinking about that as well. So that's my last slide. So I just want to say thank you again, and I welcome any questions that you have.